So when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about, uh, I got this question from Jim who invited me, and I don't think it was posted as a question in the email, but you know, I phrased it as one. This was basically in there. So how can mathematical statistics and computer intensive methods be integrated with advances in technology, for example, machine learning and blockchain? So let me admit that this was, when I got that email, that was the first time I heard about blockchain. So I'm not going to talk about that at all. Uh, I researched it a bit for this past week, so now, well, we heard about it now, so I, I shouldn't add anything. Uh, but what I want to do is emphasize these three words. So mathematical st statistics, computer-intensive methods, and machine learning. And the point that I'm really trying to drive home today, and if you remember nothing else, is that you should not separate these three things. So machine learning and statistics, they're, inter I mean, they're, they're interlinked, they're, they're intrinsically connected to each other. You can't take, well, you can take statistics without machine learning, but you can't do machine learning without statistics. Some people will tell you that you can, that's not possible. It's built on statistical principles. And uh, same thing, computer intensive methods, that's, I mean, if you want to do real statistics, you have to do computer intensive methods. And if you want to do machine learning, you have to do computer intensive methods. So research into machine learning should really be research into these areas as well. You cannot separate them or you should not separate them. Uh, so that's really what I'm trying to convey to you. And more, um, more specifically, what my focus is going to be is to tell you about what we're thinking about in terms of uh, the need for efficient computational methods and the foundations of machine learning. So that's really what we're thinking about here and, and our colleagues around the world. Uh, and the key phrase is going to be stochastic numerical methods. You're going to hear me repeat that over and over and over. Uh, if you don't know what it is, by the end of the night, just come and ask me and I'll, I'll tell you more about it. Um, so let me start with this. I, I think this is a really good figure. Uh, and Stefan said, told you that you know, machine learning or, or deep learning is not an active area in Europe or we're way behind. If we're thinking about the quantitative side, I probably don't have to convince you that probability theory and mathematical statistics, they're both fundamental in this area. You cannot really do quantitative finance without some, you know, basing it some, in some ways in, in probability and statistics. You just heard Black Scholes mentioned a couple of minutes ago. That's certainly, I mean, that's the start of quantitative finance and you know, financial mathematics if you want to. Uh, but some topics that we are thinking about here locally, so it's, it's and also not just thinking about what we think that research into machine learning and, and statistical learning where we can actually provide some, well, we can provide something that has an impact to the actual industry and not just, um, you know, for our own sake. So first is risk calculation or risk computation if you want to. Uh, we have portfolio optimization, optimal strategy, and you have pricing. And these three topics are all, it's natural to think about stochastic methods and statistical learning uh, within this setting, uh, especially we've seen it. I mean, some of you I, I recognize from taking the portfolio management or it's called portfolio management this fall. Then we talked about some of these things. And if you want to go a step further, then you get into the context of using statistical learning or uh, algorithms like that. Uh, so I want to phrase things in terms of an example problem and show you how uh, stochastic numerical methods and machine learning may show up uh, if you're interested in this. So think about the following problem that you have a large pool of assets or a, and let's say it's a thousand or a hundred or a thousand and you want to construct an optimal portfolio from those assets and we're just thinking linear combinations now um, and optimality of course requires that you, you somehow measure what's the what is an optimal portfolio so now I want to phrase it in terms of either a risk measure or I have a risk measure plus some more traditional uh, value functions you can look at expected return you can look at variance and you have that either the value function or um, the constraints in your optimization are determined by a risk measure. And the risk measure typically emphasizes tail risk. So we're really interested in you know, the risk of large losses. Uh, so how would you go about doing this? I mean, that, that's a relevant question, right? And that's what we talk about in portfolio management. And you get some tools for doing this, uh, but we can probably do better. Uh, so first, part one of sort of trying to solve this problem would be to try, I mean, you have capital N assets, so let's say 1,000 assets. If I'm going to do computation with these and, and, and actually do something quantitative, I need to model that joint distribution. So now it's a distribution of 1,000 random variables that's probably quite complex. So how do we go about doing that modeling? And what kind of tools do you, do you get when you first get into there? Well, you have this sort of mean variance framework where you know, that's fine if you have historical data, you would you know, try to estimate the mean return, try to estimate the variance of the assets, and then that's enough. 
and that's what you learn in portfolio management, step one. And that's fine, and you can solve the optimization problems. Things are, are, are convex and everything. Uh, the problem, of course, is that underlying that is some, some assumption, or almost an assumption of normal distribution. And that's too restrictive. If you're interested in tail risk, the normal distribution doesn't help us at all. So that's too restrictive. We can't use that. What's the next step? Well, or some steps further along the line, uh, maybe you go to time series modeling. You know, you have financial data, that there's time series, you try to model them. Certainly more flexible than just using the mean variance. You're tr really t taking into account the, the evolution over time. Problem there is that financial, da financial data is non-stationary. You can try to scale, take that out and do all kinds of neat tricks. But typically somewhere down the line, the non-stationarity will hurt you. Or you, you will have models that do not take into account some characteristics that are really in the data. And, and then you can go on to, to other types of modeling, but sort of the, at the core of these is, or, or core of the problems is that these type of methods, they have built-in assumptions that are either explicit, so you know about them, or implicit, that you're not really aware of them if you haven't been studying them for a long time. And you know, if you don't know those assumptions, of course, some, at some point, they're going to hurt you. Uh, and one, one way around this is, or possible way around this, we're, done, we're not sure, is to use statistical learning. And you heard the word neural networks being thrown around before by Stefan. Deep learning was what he talked about. Uh, those type of models. So that's, a, that's one avenue of going down the road. And why is that possible? Well, these methods are really, they're developed to be able, or the goal for them is to extract characteristics of the data that would otherwise be hard for us to model manually. That sort of unsupervised learning is meant to capture traits that for us are difficult to either recognize or to put in an actual model. And that's precisely the things that we're worried about here. So that's why we at least think that these models will work well in finance as well. And now we're only on battery. Uh, I think I'll manage, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, the downside, I mean, there, there's no free lunch. So it's not just, okay, we have these wonderful methods, let's just apply them. They're difficult to train, and I'm not going to go into the details of what training means because that's, you know, then we have to get into the nitty-gritty of things. But that's computationally difficult. It costs a lot. It takes a lot of time. You know, Stefan said, well, now we're down to only a couple of days. Well, in the finance industry, maybe you don't have a couple of days, to, you know, you're recalibrating your portfolio or anything. So there's a need for speeding these things up, but not losing accuracy. So that's what... That's what stochastic numerical methods are for, speeding up this process without losing sort of the, the gist of things. And it's from two points of view. It's from simulation. Um, you have to be able to, uh, to generate, generate random variables for distributions that are not standard. And it's also for optimization, because training and, uh, a deep learning model or really statistical learning model is optimization. And you have to have good methods for that, which is difficult. They're non-convex. Uh, so I'm going to skip this example, which was uh, an example of a, a network, and go to part two. So now we have our model. Okay, I've trained a statistical learning model, and it works fine. Next step is I have to, gen or I have to be able to generate samples from that model, because I will use them to, to do evaluations of things. And you know, if you use MATLAB, R, or Python, or whatever, you have these built-in functions. You, you tell the computer, give me a normal random variable, or you know, give me an exponential random variable. It doesn't work quite that easily when you have these very tricky or very complex distributions. You can't just ask for, for a vari variable with that distribution. You have to have some scheme to get that. And that's the next step. So that's also why, why, why we need stochastic numerical methods. They, they do that for us. And it's typically, if you've heard, uh, if you heard, have heard the term Markov Chain Monte Carlo, MCMC, that's typically what goes into this when you're in the statistical learning community. Uh, that's a whole industry in itself. How do we develop you know, quick, good MCMC methods for specific jobs? Uh, that's what we're thinking about. Uh, next step, now we have, so now I, can, I, have my, I have my model, I fitted the model, I can generate samples from it. Now I'm interested in trying to solve the optimization problem. Okay, now what, the first thing is there's a risk measure involved somewhere or something complex. I have to evaluate that. So pick a portfolio. Now I have to evaluate what is the risk measure for that portfolio. That's typically not analytically tractable. If you've taken the course in portfolio management or risk or anything, 
you know that even for very, very simple distributions, you can compute these things, or it's difficult to compute these things. If the distribution is fairly tricky, you can't do it analytically. You have to do it by simulation methods. And um, that's the next step. So how do we do that? Well, standard Monte Carlo would be the option. Well, that's too slow when you're thinking about things that are interested in tails of distributions or the extreme events, so large losses. If I'm used to standard methods, I will not see those events, so I will have poor accuracy or a high computational cost. It will take me a lot of time. So I have to do something smarter there, and that's what we call advanced Monte Carlo methodology. And what do they require? Well, they require rigorous mathematical analysis. And this, and I cannot emphasize enough, th this is needed because intuition can and will trick you. You come up with some scheme that you have for, that works in a certain setting, you say, oh, I got it. This is what I'm going to use, and you use it everywhere until you run into the setting where it no longer works. And then you're baffled and you have no idea what you're supposed to do. And the most dangerous setting is where you think it's working and you have no indication that it's not. Sometimes you will see that it's not converging or it's acting crazy, and then you can just say stop and you have to do something else. But what if that does not show up? So do, can we have diagnostics that tells us whether these things are working or not? That's also something that we're working you know, very actively on. And, but let's say we, we developed that, and now, again, that's stochastic numerical methods. And now we're at the final part. Now we have to find an optimal-ish portfolio. Uh, you, I don't want to say optimal. That would imply that I have the best portfolio. And whatever that means, you can't really guarantee something global here. Uh, but we, have to, we want to find something that's at least almost as good as the global optimum. And what are the problems for that? I mean, th that's optimization, right? Optimization, it's actually a lecturer here at KTH that once said, well, optimization is just taking derivatives and setting them to zero. And yes, uh, to some extent that's true, but you know, high dimensional things, non-convex things, you know, that's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, so that's the first problem. We have high dimension, you have noise, and not necessarily in the final, but in some cases you have non-convexity. These three all work against you as, an, if, as doing optimization. And what they tell you is that stochastic optimization methods are probably the way to go. And that's also an instance of stochastic numerical methods. So how can we develop optimization methods that somehow work by using, using randomness? And that's a large uh, research area in itself. Um, and we have some great ideas. That's a very active area here at KJH. Uh, so those are, I mean, I've showed you three instances of this sort of very easy to convey problem. And in all cases, stochastic numerical methods and machine learning methods would be applicable. But you have to work to get things that actually do what, you're, what you want them to do. Um, so that's the take home message. There's a great need to understand uh, the properties of stochastic numerical methods because that's when we can develop them for the task that we want. And just to finish off, so I'm a mathematician. So, and if someone else is mathematically inclined, you might ask what topics are relevant for this. Uh, so first, of course, probability theory, stochastic analysis, empirical process theory, and so on. Uh, the next thing, surprisingly, is partial differential equations. They show up in a very surprising manner and tip a specific type of equations, Hamilton-Jacobi equations, Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman. Uh, they're interesting because they do not have solutions in the classical sense. You have to define a new way or you have to find a new way to define solutions, and then you work with them. Uh, and efficient stochastic numerical methods are intrinsically linked to th these type of solutions. So you design your methods based on that. And the final thing for someone with you know, a physics background, uh, there's links to statistic statistical physics, because uh, statistical physics is a lot about what we call spin glass models. If you have ever heard about that icing model, that's a particular instance of a spin glass model. You have random matrix theory. And machine learning algorithms are precisely, or the models, you can put them in these frameworks. They're spin glass models if you want to. Uh, so if you understand the properties of these sort of very distant or foreign objects in terms of you know, computation, you can actually understand the properties of machine learning algorithms as well. So there's, that's, uh, I think, where we're going next, trying to understand the properties of these you know, very theoretic, uh, more pure mathematical objects because they link directly to machine learning algorithms. And I think with that, I'm just going to jump forward and do some, uh, well, let me do this first. So this is a quote from uh, a very prominent machine learning researcher from Stanford. He's, uh, he used this uh, at a recent machine learning conference. And I think it connects back to what Rolf talked about to some extent. 
And he said, we can build amazing things, but our understanding is in its infancy. And it's really, we have all these wonderful methods. And Stefan showed that they do all, I mean, they're really good at recognizing dogs and people and cars. But we're not sure at really, well, to some extent, why do they work and when do they work? And again, you can run them for a long time and, and they will do just fine. But then all of a sudden you hit a, you hit a scenario where they do not, do not longer work. And then you, it's better if you know why they do not work and how you can fix it. So that's really what we're trying to emphasize, that to understand the, the uh, fundamental principles of machine learning, we can really push the subject forward. And let me stop with some completely shameless self-promotion uh, or self uh, in terms of the division or the department. So there's some interesting things within this area. Uh, I mean, it's really, and I'm not biased in this sense, it's the best financial mathematics education you can get in Sweden, which, I mean, Sweden is not that big. Uh, but we're also launching a new program in the master's, in the master's, or a new track in the master's program entitled Statistical Learning and Data Science. So if you're going into your master's study, you should think about that because you know, it's going to be up and running next year, I think, and it's, uh, there's some really good courses in there. If you're already a master's student, you can probably take a course or two if you want to. Um, the research topics, I've, I've basically mentioned them, but there are plenty of opportunities for master's science theses. And because we, we're really interested in, in applying machine learning techniques within, you know, to industry. So this is also an invitation to industrial partners that we have all this knowledge how to do things in a good, you know, mathematically sound manner, but you, we need the data. So uh, if, you, if you're interested in this, we have companies that are interested in having you come out and do things as well. So uh, you should look into that. And with that, I'm stopping. So thank you.